bow our heads and pray. Father Lord, we want to thank you for this wonderful day, Lord, because this is the day that you have made. Help us to rejoice always and be glad in it, Lord. I pray that even as I speak now, Lord, that I will increase and you will increase, Lord. Be glorified and magnified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God, Church. You know, you, uh, I'm sure most of you have read recently in the newspaper about this man uh, in Delhi or I think Kerala or somewhere that uh, he was he rammed his vehicle into a security guard. I don't know how many of you have read this article. <coughs> yeah, he was a rich, arrogant man. He uh, waited at the gate for the security guard to open the gate. And because the man was delayed by a few minutes, he just, and when he opened the gate, he just rammed the vehicle into him. You know, hit him against the wall, got out of the car, dragged the man, kicked him till he died. This is the state of arrogance, you know, of many people all over the world. And this man was a very wealthy man. They say that even the slipper that he owned was almost five lakh rupees. The cars, the fleet of cars that he owned, valued to about 700 million rupees. But what was the use of all this arrogance? Because God's word is true. Pride always goes before a fall. And this man has now been sentenced to 39 years behind bars. But this is, this is the truth of men, unbelievers in the world. But God's word is also true. How much more for believers? Pride is something that God always, you know, that's, that's the root and that's the biggest sin that God detests. Yes. Today the Lord is actually was urging me actually in my spirit to talk about humility and pride because we as a church are growing. We as a church, we, you know, all of us in our spirits are yearning for more of the Lord. We are praying, we are fasting, we are studying the word and we can see that there is a desire for the word of God in all of us. So as we are growing in one body, growing closer to what the Lord has for us. Let's take these pause stops to caution ourselves so we don't fall because it is important for us to run and reach the end and not fall by the wayside. So I know this is not to attack anyone, it is not to attack or you know point fingers at anyone. It's just a word of caution so that we are careful and we stop by the way and examine ourselves so we continue the race well as the Lord would want us to run a race. Amen. You know, I know that even as we are praying and fasting and all of this, revival will take place because that's God's promise and that's what we are praying for. How many of you believe that revival is on its way? Yeah. We have already begun revival. Amen. Yeah. But revival in the land can happen only if there's revival in our church. And revival in our church can happen only if there's revival within each of us. Yes. There is no point praying for revival in the land if each of us are in revival. Yes. We, we, the Lord has to touch each of our lives. Yes. Let's go on to Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Yes. So God is talking about something that he's going to do with us in the inner man. You know, when, when Paul talks about the riches of his glory, it's very quick for us to think that he's talking about all the wealth that he's, the gold and the silver, the best jobs in the market. God is not talking about all of this when he talks about the riches of his glory. He's talking about strengthening us in his spirit. Imagine the riches of being strengthened in the spirit of the living God. And that's what he's referring to, so that we could be revived in our inner man. As we move on in that chapter to Chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, mm. with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, mm. endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Look at the emphasis the Lord is giving as we grow, as we are called to walk a walk that is worthy of the Lord. He talks about lowliness. He talks about gentleness, he talks about long suffering. All of these related to humility. Yes. There is so much emphasis that the Lord has given from Genesis to Revelations on us being humble. Because Lucifer fell because of pride. Yes. So 
it's, that, that gives us the importance of how much each of us need to grow in lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, and, and that's, that will help us to bear with each other in love, no matter what and no matter who upsets us, who troubles us. Let's understand the meaning of the word loneliness. You know, it's, it says littleness, to be little. Loneliness of mind, you know, where your mind, you, you do not think of yourself more than what you ought to think, that's what the word of God says. The Greek translation gives us the word tepeno, which means, it's a very interesting meaning, it says to level a mountain or a hill. Imagine what it means to be humble. It's to have no hills sticking out of us. So every time we talk about being humble, don't have any hills sticking out of you. It's a very interesting meaning. You know, it means that we are not filled with this hot air, wagons and, you know, flying high. Many times, we all think we are very humble. But there are various little, little areas that our humility does not show. It's more arrogance that comes through. So Jesus, in fact, Jesus told the Jews, don't take the seats in the front. Go back and take the seats at the back. So that's a behavior of not being self-exalted. That means you're not putting yourself in the front. You take the back seat. Then there's also an interesting word, meekness. You know, sometimes we tend to mix up the meaning of meekness and weakness. Mm. You know, God is not asking us to be weak. We are strong in the Lord. Yeah. And we have enough word to tell us that we are strong in the Lord. Yeah. So we are not weak, but we need to be meek. Because only then will we inherit the earth. Yes. So what do you mean by meekness? Mm. Meekness is actually great strength. It's not our strength, it is God's strength. Yes. So which means, Meekness is bringing out God's strength under His control. So you have a lot of power with the living God, you have a lot of strength with the living God, but bring it out under His control. So which means, we are not, I'm not talking about that man who drove his vehicle into the security guard, I'm talking about the church. We who are called by His name, we who are strengthened by the living God, we have, who have a lot of strength in the living God, we need to act under the control of the living God. Because then our arrogance will not come out. Because the Lord's control would come over his own strength in each of us. Now for the believer, you know sometimes, this morning I, I remember uh, Brother Soong saying, we can't love without the help of the Holy Spirit, without the help of God. It's the same way, that's why God has added meekness as one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It's not easy for us to be meek. We tend to, you know, let that control of the Lord go out and we show the strength of the Lord without His control. Mm. So that's why meekness is actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, it, it is so beautiful that as we build ourselves as a body of Christ, as we grow together, we are one in the Lord and we are moving forward. A healthy body of a child, when a child is born, you know, the first few years you have a lot of injections that we have to give the child, immunization. Right? We as a body of Christ, as we grow, need to be immunized. We need to be immunized of selfishness, pride, prejudice. You know, all these things would actually ruin the body. Like if you don't immunize a baby with polio, the child has, there's a risk of the child growing up with polio. Mm. It's the same thing with the body of Christ. Each of us need to be consciously immunized. And when, we are, when I'm talking about each of us, I also talk about the body. We need to let go of pride, we need to let go of selfishness, we need to let go of hatred and all that comes in the way of us being one. No, because the word of God says that we are one faith, one Lord and one baptism. Yes. But we also have one law. Yes. And what is that law? John 13, 34 to 35 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you so that you must, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Mm. How is it possible for us to love one another if we are not immunized of ourselves, of hatred, of prejudice, of narrow mindedness? It is very difficult to love one another. We can say that we love, but we really cannot love. When I talk about husbands and wives, we know how difficult it is to love if you do not love your spouse without thinking of yourself. That, that is how, that is true love. When you do not think of yourself and you're able to love more than yourself. That's why the self should be 
we should immunize of ourselves totally. You know, as we stand together, as we say, take stock, and as we work towards survival. Let me remind you of a story during the Welsh revival. You know, there was, I'm, not, I'm sure many of you would have read or heard about the Welsh revival. It was a massive revival. And the newspaper men in London decided that they would go down to Wales to check out what this revival was all about. So they, they come by train and they reach Wales. And then one of these people go out to a, a policeman standing there and says, Can you tell us where this Welsh revival is? You know what the policeman did? He drew himself up to his full height and he laid his hand on his heart and he proudly proclaimed, Gentlemen, the Welsh revival is inside this uniform. He had actually caught the fire. So this evening, I want to ask each of us, have we caught the fire? If somebody asks us, where's the revival? Are we ready to say, it's here inside? Let's look at the biblical perspective of the Bible. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 to 15. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. And Solomon successfully accomplished all that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. We are talking about a church that is completed, the temple that is completed. <clears throat> Here we are, a people already completed. We are all working together. I doubt if there are even a few of us who are not ready in working towards this Bible. All of us are. We are all game and we are all ready and the temple is getting built. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. How many of you believe God has chosen us as a, for himself? I believe it. And yes, and as he has chosen us and this place as his temple and his house of sacrifice, he's also talking about a physical condition. Yes. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, we all know the situation. There's recession everywhere. There's drought everywhere, there's famine everywhere. You know, when you look at the world, it's so dismal and so horrible. You, you can't speak to someone in the world and be lifted up. It's impossible. Because in these market conditions, you speak to anybody. You speak to a banker, you speak to a businessman, they will talk about how bad the business is, how dismal the jobs are going, there are no, no jobs available. That's the condition the Lord is talking about. And then the Lord is talking about a spiritual condition. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their hand. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. What a wonderful God. He's talking about it all. He's laid out the entire thing. He's talking about choosing us. He's talking about the physical conditions outside. He's talking about the spiritual conditions inside. And he's also talking about what he's going to do. Beautiful, wonderful Savior actually. Now as the Lord is, so let's, let's just look at this little spiritual condition because let me tell you, if there has to be physical renewal, there has to be something happening in our physical lives, the drought has to go, famine has to go, first of all, the Lord has to work spiritually. That's the condition for, for people of the Lord. Unless there's spiritual re revival, the physical will not be done, will not be cleaned up. There cannot be something great happening physically. Because the word of God says, seek first the kingdom of God. First, the kingdom of God. Then, and his righteousness, then everything else will be added. The job and the healing and all of those bonus factors will come in. That's a taken. So let's look at the spiritual condition that the Lord is talking about. First one, humble yourselves. Pray. I'm sure all of us are praying much. We are seeking this peace. And we need to turn from our wickedness. You know, always, anywhere in the world you look at what stopped revival, it's always been pride. Now there was a very famous preacher, he was an evangelist, Harry Morehouse. He was still a young man and he was conducting evangelistic crusades all over the place. And then in one of the cities in the US he was conducting an evangelical meeting and there was nothing happening. So he prayed and he prayed and he asked the Lord, what is happening? Why is it that revival is not happening in this place? And one night as he was on his knees, the Holy Spirit reminded him of something. It was a placard that he had seen the previous day. And it read, Harry Moorhouse, the most famous of all British preachers. 
Once he said, that's why there's no revival. So he ran to the campaign committee and he said, you know why there is no revival here? Look at the way you advertised. I'm the great this and the great that. No wonder the Holy Spirit will not work. He is grieved. He is quenched. Because you haven't magnified the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a wonderful one. I'm just a poor, simple, humble worker. I'm just preaching his God, gospel, preaching the gospel of the Lord. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Can we remember that? Have we displaced God from who he is? You know, when you look at John the Baptist, when he was in the womb, the Holy Spirit came upon him. How, how much reason for him to, be, to feel that he was a great preacher? And his ministry was running parallel with the ministry of Jesus. Now, this John the Baptist, who he could have very well preached, continued doing what he was doing, and not given attention to the ministry of Jesus. But what did he say? Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Today, where is our attention? Is it on the Lamb of God or is it on ourselves? Let's just take a quick check that we don't fall into the same sin. What are the few areas of pride that the Lord does not like? First of all, let's understand what the Bible talks about pride. Who is the root cause of pride? Satan. We all know that. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were in the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. The Lord is talking about Lucifer as being perfect in his ways. Perfect from the day the Lord was created him. Till a point where iniquity touched him. You know this cherubim was symbolic of God's holy presence and his unapproachable majesty. If you remember, in the Old Testament, when uh, Adam and Eve were sent out of the Garden of Eden, the cherubim was asked to stand at the gate uh, before the tree of life and guard it. That's the position that was given to Lucifer. When Moses built the Holy of Holies, he made the mercy seat and he took it and kept it in the Holy of Holies. The cherubim guard the holy seat. It says, the word of God says that God's presence rested on that holy seat and the cherubim covered it. That's the exalted place that we have. What a what a wonderful place. What a what an awesome place. A place that will protect the holiness of God. That's the place that Lucifer had. And he was a picture of perfect wisdom. Let's go on to um, Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. How you are fallen from heaven. Oh, I'm sorry, the verses are not up. But you can read Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, mm -hmm. to the far reaches of the pit. Mm -hmm. Look at the number of I will, I will, I will. Yes. Mm -hmm. Satan's root cause of fall was I. Yes. He, he wanted to exalt himself. He wanted to raise himself above. He, it was all the I that brought him down story of pride. An angel who was appointed and exalted fallen due to pride. Let's examine ourselves. Let's take stock to see if there's any area we are exalting ourselves. Because that's the root cause of fall. Ezekiel 20, 28 verse 17 describes Satan, you know, it talks about your heart became proud on account of your beauty. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So imagine Satan was a very beautiful person. Beautiful, full of splendor, mm. highest of all of the angels, but one who took pride in all of this. He, you know, he was so impressed with his own beauty that he decided that he could kick God out of his own position. Mm. That's what happened. And that's exactly what led to his fall as well. That's exactly what mm. Satan did when he tempted Adam and Eve as well, trying to shake, take away the position of God and displace the position of God. So today let's remember the root cause every time there is a hill sticking out of us it is Satan at work. 
Because Satan is the root cause of pride. Now we know also that God hates pride. The, the word of God says in Psalm 101 verse 5, The man of haughty looks and arrogant heart, I will not, not endure. God is very clear. The word, if, you, if you study the word, there are so many verses to let you know how much the Lord hates pride. Isaiah 22 verse 11 says, The haughty looks of man shall be brought low, and the pride of men shall be humbled, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. You know, when you talk about haughty looks, you know, many of us you feel, some of us feel it has nothing to do with us. But aren't there, isn't that shrug, that, you know, I know it all attitude? Many of us have that. Many of us think, you know, we may not show it on our face, we may, not, we may, have, we may have it in our heart. But the Lord is examining us this morning, this evening. And He's reminding us that He hates it. He hates pride. Jeremiah 50 verse 31 says, Behold, I am against you, O proud one. I pray the Lord would not let any of us be the ones that He is against. He says, For your day has come, the time when I will punish you. Pride also brings shame and destruction. Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. We all know that saying, Pride goes before a fall. So remember, each time you are exalting yourself, remember there is a fall coming your way. And that's the warning the Lord is giving us today. Proverbs 18 12 says, Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Now there is another interesting one. Pride does not allow us to be teachable. All of us have gone through this. Whether we may have been young, as children, whether with our teachers, even at this age, we don't like connection. The minute something, yeah, many of us are like touch me knows, the minute something is said, a little correction from here or there, do not look at the way the correction has come. Just look at it as feedback. Many times it happens. He looked at me, he said this. Children, youngsters undermining you when parents correct you. You know, there's something that, it's only pride that will stop you from taking connection. I'm reminding the youngsters because you have many more years to go. And it's good to take this learning early in life. Because God does not tolerate pride. And, and, and pride always comes in the way of correction. You know, because when you, when you see Proverbs 26 verse 12, it says, Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is no hope for a fool. There is more hope for a fool than for him. So God is telling you that the fool has more hope than you if you do not if you're not willing to take correction. Yes. So let us stop looking at the way the correction comes. Today that's a little reminder for each of us. Maybe the person who's giving you the correction is giving it to you with a lot of pride. It doesn't matter. What is the correction? What is the feedback for us? Let's look at that and let's be teachable. Because if we are not teachable, each of us need to remind ourselves. But there's a little bit of pride in us that is stopping us from being teaching. Jeremiah 13 verse 9 to 10 says, God says to the people of Judah, I will destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, the wicked people who refuse to listen to my words. So any of us here, today remember what uh, Pastor Leo spoke to us about. He said, don't just be sayers, don't just be hearers, but be doers of the word. Yes, yeah, so the word of God again says in Jeremiah here, this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts. A reminder again for us, be doers of the word. Do not refuse to listen to the word of God that God sends us. Pride also makes you forget God. This is something very interesting because I have seen this in, personally for myself and among all of us Christians. You know, we pray, we seek God, we need. We have a need, we are at His feet, we are asking and we are praying. And then the Lord answers. The Lord comes through. And then when it comes through, many times, these are, the, you know, the jobs. You work one year, you work two years down the line, and then you have issues at work. And then you forget that it's the Lord who gave you this job. And then sometimes you take, you, you, you take ownership over, over that job. And you take so much pride in that job, you forget the Lord that gave you this job. Yes. You know, Moses was born in. The Israelites about this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 11 to 17. 12 to 17. Lest when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them and when your herds and your flocks multiply 
and your silver and your gold multiply, then your heart becomes proud. And you forget the Lord, your God, who brought you out from the land of Egypt. And you say in your heart, my power and my strength in my hand may be in strength. Don't we do this even with our you know, students, with your studies, when you do well, you remember that it is the Lord's wisdom that made you do well. It is the Lord who exalts. It is the Lord who puts you up. It is the Lord who is lifted of our heads. It is the Lord who brings us through situations when we are fallen and lifts us up. Let us not forget to give Him the due glory. Let us not become so self-sufficient that we forget the one who is the source of all our sufficiency. Another one, pride loves a lot of attention and a lot of exaltation. Every time you wonder why you were not given credit, remember that's pride asking this question. Every time you remember why you are in a small little corner doing something that's so insignificant and nobody notices you, Remember that's pride with us in this question. Every time somebody does not give you credit or give somebody else credit for what you have done, remember that it's pride asking you that question. Today the Lord is asking us, reminding us again about those Jews who he spoke to in Matthew 23, 6. He says that they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called by men rabbi. They love to be called those, those right names. They love to be recognized for, the, for what they have done. Don't you feel that much of this is there in each of us too? If you are not recognized, if somebody doesn't give us that good word, wow, you've done a good job, then you wonder maybe they didn't notice that I've done this. Let's, let's cut out all of this because we are, working, we are walking towards a bigger, much bigger reward. We don't need reward on earth. We don't need the exaltation of man on earth. We need to put God in the front. Let's, let's displace ourselves and let's put God in front, everywhere. You know, humility always begins when we are convicted of sin. So we spoke about what pride does and what the Bible talks about pride. If we are convicted of sin, that's the beginning of humility. You know, Paul wrote in Romans 12 verse 3, that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think of ourselves with sound judgment. You know, let's have a realistic evaluation of ourselves. Let me tell you, this realistic evaluation can sometimes go haywire also. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 says, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you did not? The scripture is full of warnings, always telling us not to forget what our condition is, not to forget where we got what we have, what we are from. But how can we, and many of you might say that I am a very blessed person. Why should I think so lowly of myself? Yes, I agree. God, in God, we are more than conquerors. In God, we are more than strong. So definitely let's not get our position mistaken. Let's not forget who we are in Christ. If we have to live a victorious Christian life that bears fruit and pleases God, we must, we should not forget the past, where we came from. That's why the Lord reminds us, what you have that you did not, that you were not given. Don't forget where you come from. But also don't forget where you're going. Very important for us to remember who we are in Christ. How, how mighty we are in Christ. How strong we are in Christ. And let's also remember, let's, and that's holy pride. To know who we are. I can stand and I can boast that I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens me. I can stand here and say that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can boast about the Lord. And that's holy pride. I take pride not in myself, but in the Christ who is in me. But we also need to remember that what we are, what I am, I am only because of the Lord. Let's stand in awe and wonder what God has done for us. God does not stop us from doing that. But also let's remember that we have been forgiven much. You know, many times we take that very lowly position, oh, I'm nothing, I, who am I? That's a dangerous position to be in because then we are forgetting what God has done for us. So let's not mix up humility so much that all of us forget who we are in Christ. We need to know who we are and we need to stand strong knowing who we are. You know, there are two kinds of people if you notice. There are some who got major testimonies. We have Pastor Sammy here, Pastor Andy here, they talk about all that they did, all that they were in the past and how the Lord has saved them. There's another category. Maybe I can put myself in it. I haven't done really much in terms of, you know, of having such a colorful past. But if 
that's what you want to call it. But that's a danger. There's a lot of danger for those kind of people because we we can have spiritual pride, and the Lord is warning us about that because there's no difference. No matter what you have done, no matter how bad your life has been or how good your life has been, we are all in that bunch of dirty apples. We are all in that basket. We are all the same bunch of dirty apples. And today the Lord is reminding all of us there is no difference between one who has done all the worst things in their past and one who thinks that he has not had a very bad past. We are all a bunch of dirty apples saved by grace. And I just praise the Lord that all of us have been saved by the same God with the same blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. So let's not mix up who we are in Christ. Then we have those who are proud and imagine that they are humble. And you see many, they are actually very proud, but imagine that they are humble. And we have another class of people who are so humble and they are so afraid to be proud. Those are the class that I am talking about. We need to know who we are in Christ. Don't be afraid to be proud of Christ in you. And we have a third one, where they totally forget about themselves and they leave everything in the hands of Christ and they refuse to waste their time taking, trying to make themselves good and humble. That's the category of the people who are running ahead actually. Because they've forgotten themselves, they've handed it all over to Christ and they're allowing Christ to do all that he has to do. No pride in being humble, no fear in being proud. Totally submitted to the Lord. And when we understand humility, let's remember, it's not pushing yourself forward or backward. Both. Don't push yourself forward to exalt yourself because the Lord will put you down. Don't push yourself backwards because you're not exalting Christ if you push yourself backwards. You know, the beautiful example of Barnabas in the Bible, his actual name was Joseph. But you know what people called him? Son of encouragement. How wonderful. He was not called by his own name because he was constantly one who was an encourager, always pushing someone in the front. So today, let me ask you, how many times did you just push somebody else in the front? Put yourself at the back. Give the other person a hand. Push the other person, move forward, encourage the other person. Let's have Lord Barnabas here. Lots of sons of encouragement here in the house of the Lord. Now, the most humble person in the Bible, who is he? I'm not talking about Jesus, I'm talking about Moses. You know, Moses, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a beautiful story. We all know, even the little one Sophie will also tell us the story of Moses. Right from how his parents took him, put him in a basket, went into the he was taken by the prince, princess into the palace of the Egyptians. Grew up there, grew up like a prince. You know, he had much favor there. And people loved him. He was a captain of the Egyptians over there. In, in, in fact, Acts 7, 21 says, Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. We all know Moses is a stammerer, but here it says he was mighty in words and deeds. So he was a man who, I'm sure he was a good orator as well. He was in the palace, he spoke well, he had all the power and the power to be the prince of the earth. And at the same time, he, he was also aware that he was going to be a deliverer. And for all you know, my imagination tells me that when he killed the Egyptian protecting the Israelite, he must have been taking that very seriously, that he was going to be the deliverer. But then, what did God do? He was out on exile, 40 long years in the wilderness. This man must have been thinking of leading people out of Egypt. This man who was thinking of leading people, saving the Israelites, was here looking at the stars of the sky. This same man was in the wilderness instead of the palace of the Egyptians. And I don't think he even wondered, he must have wondered, where am I going? What did they tell me? Where did they say that I'm going to be a deliverer? God had different plans for him. God was taking him through the humbling process. Right now, there are many of us who are going through the humbling process. They are going through that learning of learning to be humble. Total dependence on the Lord. Breaking. That breaking is happening. And all of us, I know each of us can, if we are not going through it, we have gone through it. Or that sometime in life we will go through it. Because God goes, God does that beautiful humbling process in each of us. But he teaches us how to not look at ourselves but to look at Him. Totally. To the extent that when the burning bush, when the Lord called Moses, he was saying, how can I go? The same prince of Egypt was talking, how can I go? I'm a stammerer. He came down to that point where he was not dependent on himself. 
He just needed the Lord to take him. He went where the Lord took him and he had no, absolutely no dependence on sin. He spoke what the Lord spoke through him. He went where the Lord went to ask him to go and he did not speak when the Lord asked him not to speak. That's the beauty of humility. Because when the Lord humbles you, He teaches you obedience. That's the next step. He really humbles you to the point where you are able to listen to His voice and follow His instructions. Now when you move on to Numbers 12, 1 to 3. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken to us also? Let me just take a pause here. You know, if I were to imagine how the Bible should have been written, at this place, the next sentence would have been, and Moses explained to them about how the Lord spoke to him at the burning bush, how the Lord called him. But what does it say here? And the Lord heard it. The Lord, take a pause. The Lord heard it. And then in the next verse, it's so beautiful. Sometimes you think it's out of context. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Look at the context in which this verse is put there. When he could have justified himself, when he could have stood there and said why he was where he was and why he spoke the way he spoke, the Lord said, and the man Moses was most humble. And if you read on, if you go back and read, read on, the, the Lord justifies for Moses. Moses does not say a word. The Lord stands there and the Lord tells Miriam and Adam, why he, how he had called Moses and why he had called and how he was speaking to Moses. And then after this, you see how the Lord's anger came on Miriam and she was struck with leprosy. You know, it is so beautiful to see what God does when you are humble. He will stand on your behalf. Isaiah 57, 15 says, For thus said the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, with him also, that is a contrite and humble spirit. You know, if you want to dwell where God dwells, in a high and holy place, the Lord is reminding us, it is only those with a contrite and a humble spirit that can dwell with the Lord in a high and holy place. A reminder for each of us to have a contrite and a humble spirit. Today, can I ask each of us, what is our eagerness to decrease so that Christ may be all in all? I'm not talking about big things. I'm talking about small little things where each of us knows personally. How much are we willing to let others receive the prominence? A little bit of caution. Let always be a Barnabas. Let the others receive the prominence. And you take the back seat. And if all of us are doing that, we would only be pushing each other forward. None of us would be exalting ourselves. How much are we willing to allow others to receive credit for what we have done? That's a bit difficult. I've done it all. I worked so hard. I sat through the night. I worked. And somebody else is getting the credit. The Lord is asking us, how much are we doing for that? By our joy, how, how, how much do we take joy in working the hardest in those small little jobs that are not so exciting? How much do we allow God take his vengeance or do we all stand there and stand and justify and explain and, and later justify that's why I said it because it was you know I had done it and I let's not be like Satan where I will and I will let's remove the eye out of us how well do we take criticism how many of us are touching us how many of us are willing to be corrected are we inwardly greed when somebody else is exalted have you gone through those little sad moments when somebody else is being lifted I lifted up and think, why am, um, why am I not being lifted up? Are we willing to have others help us when we are doing something or, or do we want to show our name at the end of the project? Oh, signed and written by Suniti. And no other hand in it. Or are we all together holding each other's hand and moving forward? Small reminders that the Lord is giving us. Young people, the Lord is cautioning you. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, Submit yourselves to your elders. You know, I, I know many of you may be wondering why I'm constantly reminding the younger ones. There's a lot of items. These days, the youngsters are going in an age where gadgets and social media has caught up a lot. The youngsters know more than the older ones. But that could always pride pops up. Knowledge pops up sometimes. 
So that's, it's a caution. It says, young people, submit yourselves to your elders. And this is not only for the young people. The word of God says, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God presses the proud. But God gives grace to the humble. How many of us can confidently say, say that we have displaced ourselves and placed God where he has to be? You know, if you look at the book of Corinthians, if you study the book of Corinthians, there's so much, as I was studying this, I, I have not touched that chapter or that whole book it's at all because there's a whole study of it. Because when God speaks, when Paul speaks to the Corinthians, he talks about pride so many times. So from my understanding of that book, of that book definitely the, you know, the church of Corinth, Corinth had a lot of pride. They had to deal with a lot of pride. Now I picked a few verses that I came across where, where Paul was really picking on them and asking them to get rid of pride. Why am I saying this? It's because we are also in this age. You know, Corinthian church was a rich church. They had a lot of, you know, very much like a modern church now. And that's why I picked these verses because we are also a church that's growing. We have all those signs that, are, that they had in those days. 1 Corinthians 1 29 says, so that no human being might boast. And these verses are not up there. I just said, I was studying, I said, let me just add this because I know that the Lord is reminding us as much as He reminded the uh, church of God. 1 Corinthians 1.29 So that no human being might boast in the presence of the Lord. There must have been some problem there. The people were boasting of themselves more than of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.31 says Therefore as it is written, let him be bo who boasts, boast in the Lord. I really believe that there was a lot of boasting out there. So neither 1 Corinthians 3.7 So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. So there were a lot of people who were planting and watering and doing the work of the Lord. But only God gives growth. Paul is reminding everybody, it's only the Lord who gives growth. Let us not take credit for anything that we are doing. Whether planting, whether we are testifying, whether we are watering, whether we are holding somebody's hand, nothing. It is only God who gives the growth. We are a church ready for revival. It is only the Lord who can give us the growth. 1 Corinthians 3.21 says, So let no one boast of men. Let us not give credit to each other as well. Let us give only credit to the living God who works in each of us. Let us praise the Lord who is working in and through us. 1 Corinthians 4, 6 That none of you may be puffed up, puffed up in favor of one against another. You know, verse 7 says, Then you received it. Why do you boast as if it were not, as if it were not a gift? Again he's telling us, it is What you have is what you have received. So don't boast about it because it's not what you have. It's what was given to you. And also says in 1 Corinthians 5, 2, and you are arrogant. We are, the Lord is asking us, are we an arrogant people? You know, it's just so beautiful that it's the same Paul is saying, and that I, I consider all of this as trash. The same Paul was educated, he had all wealth, he had his own business, tent making, he was, a, he was a prosperous man. And he considered all of it as rubbish, but for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Today, as we are on the verge, just ready for the Bible, let's examine ourselves. Let's put aside any form of pride that may come in the way of the Lord working in us. Let's go back to that first Chronicles verse. Because the Lord has promised that He will hear from heaven. Any of you who are in your pit wondering whether the Lord is going to work for you, the Lord has promised you He will hear from heaven. It's a non negotiable because we as a church, definitely are going to be doers of the world. We are definitely going to be doers and not just hearers. As we humble ourselves, as we pray together, as we seek God's face, and as we turn from our wicked ways, the Lord will hear from heaven. All of our needs. He will forgive our sin and He will heal our land. And when I talk about healing, He is not only going to heal us spiritually, He is going to heal us physically. If there are needs here, physical needs that are not being met, Remember the Lord is promising us He will heal our land. Yes. We will be healed spiritually. We will be a church that will move from glory to glory. We will move to the next step of glory. We will be ready for what the Lord has the next step. At every level the Lord has something waiting for us. So as we prepare to move on to the next level and as we humble ourselves we, let's receive this promise from the Lord that He is going to heal our land. Pastor can you please close in mind.
Hallelujah. Let's all rise in the presence of God. As a, as a dear sister brought a very powerful word, very timely word. Right, we are right in the first month of the year and the Lord is reminding us, you know, that we'll humble ourselves. You know, take the mind of Christ. He humbled himself to such an extent that he suffered the shameful death of the cross of Calvary. And therefore, the Bible says, therefore, the Lord God Almighty lifted him up so much, his name so high. It says in Philippians 2, 9 to 11, that every knee should bow in heaven. It's mandatory. That every knee should bow in heaven. In heaven, sister talked about the cherubim. She talked about Lucifer. But the cherubim, even today, in heaven, there are seraphims, there are angels, there are archangels, there are living creatures, and they all bow at the name of Yeshua. They all bow at the name of Yahweh. And and the angels they cover with with two wings. They cover the face. They cover the feet with two. They fly, crying out, Holy, Holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy is Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters, it's a call of the Holy Spirit that we will humble ourselves. That we will take that step forward, renouncing any area which is puffed up, taking out the leaven from our lives, and saying, God, have mercy upon me. Deliver me from the spirit of Leviathan. Deliver me from every form of arrogance. Deliver me from every pride. Deliver me, O Lord, from, from high attitude. O Lord God Almighty, deliver me, O God, for me and us thinking more highly of ourselves. Deliver us from looking down on others. That is also stems up because of pride. Looking down on others. Looking down on your spouse, on your children, on your siblings. Looking down on your brother and sister in the house of God. Oh my dear brothers and sisters, is the call of the Holy Spirit. It has come from the throne room of God. A very powerful word for you and me to consider tonight. Consider. That's what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 8. Come, let us reason together. God is calling us to come to that banqueting table and reason together. And he says that if you have sins like scarlet and is red, come and talk to me. Come and commune with me. I will make you clean. I am the Jehovah Makadesh, the Lord who makes us clean. That song was sung so beautifully. Without Jehovah, without Yeshua, we can't be holy. We need to stand on the holy ground. We need to take off our shoes. Our shoes talks about our reliance and our dependence in our own ability. That's why he took off his shoes and he approached into that holy ground that was burning with that bush of fire when God met with Moses. He had to take off his reliance on his worldly status. And he said, God, here am I, naked, barefoot. O oh Lord, I'll stand in your presence. Come on, church, pray. This word is for you. This word is for me. This word is for the senior pastor. This word is for the bishop. This word is for the associate pastor. This word is for the elders. This word is for deacons. This word is for every brother and every sister who works in the house of God or you are an attender or you are a guest. Because he loves you with an everlasting love. And he wants to see that essence of the character of Christ to emanate through your life. And my life. So if you have to repent of your arrogance, repent now. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It'll be too late when the door is shut. Let us be in the category of the wise. And the Bible very clearly says he gives wisdom to the humble. 
If you are lacking wisdom today to make the right choices in life, then check the level of wisdom in your, in your life. Probably there is pride that's a hindrance to your life. Probably there is an area of arrogance, a hindrance to your growth. And the Lord is pointing that finger tonight, saying, my son, I'm reminding you of my beloved son with whom I was well pleased because he said not my will but your will be done and he still went ahead and died for you and me. My dear brothers and sisters, a dead man does not feel pinpricks. As the word has come for tonight and if your emotions are pricked, if your pride is pricked, you're still alive to yourself. And that is the word that God is saying. Allow me to crucify you on the cross of Calvary with my son Yeshua. Allow me. You cannot crucify yourself. Allow the Holy Ghost say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender all to you. We sing that song, I surrender all, but a lot of time we hold it all along and we don't give it all to the Lord. But if we give all to the Lord, I promise you, His word will come through like a wave of His glory, like a power of His Holy Ghost. The anointing of God will just sweep over your life, over your emotions, uh, over your spirit and soul and your body and you will be a wholesome personality. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us tonight. Thank you for your word, O God, that your handmaiden has brought to us. My dear brothers and sisters, if you if you need prayer, Sister Suniti is here. She will lay hands on you, pray with you. Very quickly step out. We have five minutes more. Very quickly step out. And she will lay hands on you, pray with you, and impart God's anointing upon your life. And I promise you, your life will not be the same. Your life will not be the same. Don't look to the left or right, look to your heart. Don't look here, there, who's going, who's coming. You look to your heart. Because God is looking to your heart. He is not interested in your status. He's not looking to the outwardly. He's looking to the inwardly. And the word of God is like a double-edged sword that cuts us. Soul and spirit and body. He removes those tumors of growth. Those boils of pride, those acne of arrogance, he removes them. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we bless you. We worship you. We humble ourselves before you. Lord, your word has commanded us to humble ourselves. So God, we will be obedient tonight to humble ourselves and say, God, have mercy. Have mercy. Oh God, let you be the glory and the lifter of our head, not ourselves. Amen. 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 Come on church, pray, pray, pray. Pray in tongues, pray in your language. Come on, everywhere. Come on, come on, cry out to the Lord. It is your time, it is your night, it is the Sabbath. The blessing of Sabbath is going to come upon you. God is going to bless you and feed you in the heritage of Jacob and cause you to ride on the high places of the earth if you humble yourself. Condition is if you humble yourselves. 
When God has flourished you and prospered you, your gold and your silver has multiplied. Don't let your heart become stout. Don't let your heart become full of pride. I say, God, is all because of your grace and of your mercy. What am I that you're mindful of? Come on. What am I? King David is saying, what am I, O oh Lord, that you are mindful of? Amen. You have made me a little lower than the angels, but yet you have given me authority and power over all the works of your hands. Come on, children, pray. Come on, children, pray. Come on, children, pray. Don't look here then. This is the time of the visitation of God to us. Come on, children. The word, my sister, very clearly told young people, children, come on, don't get so lofty and full of pride because you know better than your father, you better know than your mother. Humble yourself, submit to the elders, submit to one another. Come on. Are you obedient to your parents? Are you obedient to your life leaders? Are you obedient to your pastors? Come on. It's the call of the Holy Spirit. Come on everywhere. All the youth pray. Just say, Lord, I humble myself. I humble myself. Change me, Lord. Change me, Jesus. Change me, Holy Ghost. Change us as a church, O Lord. Oh, Father, change us. Oh, Allah, change us. Change me, O Lord. We humble ourselves. We humble ourselves before your throne of grace. We lay down our crowns before you and say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive all glory and all honor and all greatness and all power and all authority. That's what Gideon said. I am of the least of the tribe. The least and the lowest. But God can see the least and the lowest and lift you up in that place to the mountain top if you are willing. The choice is ours if you are willing. If you are willing to lay it down at the altar, then God is also willing. Take hold of your God is all there to bless you. Just receive that word. That receive that word that has come forth under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Say, God, O oh Lord, let me decrease. You increase in me. That was the prayer of John the Baptist. Let me decrease, but you increase. Let the world see Jesus in me. Not Samuel. Let the world see Jesus in me. Not Pastor Samuel. Come on. Not you. When they look at you, they will see the glory of you. They will see the Shekinah, the radiance of His glory, of His power, just coming down, just in spirit and an outstanding glory. Come on. That's what the Lord is saying. That's what the Lord is saying. Acquaint yourself with the Lord. Acquaint yourself. Jesus. Get to know Him. Acquaint yourself. Job 22 21 says so. Acquaint yourself with your God. A lot of times we become too familiar with His presence. Too familiar with the Word. Too familiar with the teaching and the doctrine. Blood of the Lamb, 
by the word of the gospel, Make us holy. Make you are holy. Take away from the Lord every every iota of pride. Take away every Lord spot that speck of the that dot, that blemish. Take it away. God cleanse us, purify us, God. His hands are not shot that it cannot come. It is because of our sins that he hides his face. It is because of our deliberate sins. Sense of commission. Sense of omission. Sense of commission are the sins that we deliberately do. After knowing the truth, we still indulge. After knowing the word, we still go through that path. And the Lord is saying, Now is your time. When you will break that Adamic nature, that stubborn heart, that you will tear down the altars of prayer, destroy it, crush it, kick it, powder it, pour it on the river. pastor of this church, I repent, O oh Father, on behalf of your people, and I say, have mercy, have mercy upon us, O oh God, forgive us, O oh God, our sins, O oh God, forgive us, O oh God, on behalf of our pastors, on behalf of our elders, on behalf of our deacons, on behalf of our brothers and sisters, O oh God, and on behalf of the congregation, O oh Lord, if you have grieved your Holy Ghost, we repent tonight. And say, oh Lord, have mercy. Yes. Have mercy upon us, O oh God. Yes, Lord. Have mercy. Forgive us. Forever, Lord. Mercy. Help us to take the mind of Christ in us. Yes. The mind of Christ that is lowly and humble, obedient, to an extent that he is willing to suffer the shameful death of the yes. cross. Yes. Holy Ghost, I pray that you will fill us with an overflow of your Spirit of God and the very character of Christ, the very essence of Jesus' nature and character will be fully formed in us. See for us. Take away every maturity from us, God. 
the way we act and react at times. Oh Lord, exposes our heart's condition. Oh Father, I pray, take away that immature season. Oh Father, bring us to a time of place of maturity, of steadfastness, of faithfulness in the name of Jesus. And each and every one of us will be healed. Our marriages will be blessed. Our children will be blessed. Our finances will be blessed. Our jobs will be blessed. Our businesses will be blessed. Oh Lord, we will see the tangible blessing of God overtake our lives in the name of Jesus. And when we talk about revival, people say, meet me. For I am a man that is revived. I am a woman that is revived by the Holy Spirit. Give us the grace. Bless us. Have mercy upon us. The sense of omission and commission. Have mercy upon us. O oh Lord, give us, O oh Father, the grace. O oh Lord, give us that spirit of meekness. The meek shall inherit the earth. O oh Father, give us meekness. O oh Lord, I ask of you, let it be formed in us as a church in the name of Jesus. And grant us wisdom. Wisdom to the young ones, to the youth, to the children. Wisdom in marriage. Wisdom in homes. Wisdom in making the right decisions at the right time. O Lord God Almighty, wisdom of God, O Father, to stand on the holy ground where God can take over. Wisdom where we can say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. You're good, you're acceptable and perfect, will be done. Yes, O Lord, we are yours and you are ours. And the banner of us is the love of heaven. Is the love of the Father. Lord, as you saw that, I declare your blessing upon your handmaid as she's brought forth your word of God. Yes. Freshly baked bread yes. from the ovens of heaven. Yes. And she has fed your church, broken that bread and gave it to us that we will be strengthened in the inner man. I pray that you will reward her, bless her. Her husband and her children will be blessed. Yes, and everything that they do will be blessed. Amen. There will be no lack of anything Amen. spiritual or physical or financial in their lives. The future will be filled with the favor of God. Thank you, Lord. And you will be alone glorified. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Hmm. And I pray, Lord, as you serve and declare and I decree the blessings of God upon each and every soul that is present in this auditorium, in this sanctuary. I release your anointing. I release your holiness. I release your power. I release your word of God. And I pray that Lord will be grounded and will be rooted in your word. That we will possess the land that you have given us. That we will destroy those Anakims and those giants and take the land that you are giving us. And we want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for UAE. Thank you for Dubai, Sharjah. Thank you for the rulers, the government. Thank you for the place, the sanctuary that you've given us in this country. That we can praise you and bless you and worship you. I pray that your anointing will overtake and bless this nation. In Jesus' most holy, mighty, and matchless name, we pray. Amen. Now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of His sweet Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. And all of us say, Amen. 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 Give the Lord a big round of applause. I know the time is up.